The state is a gun. Metaphorically, but almost literally. The definition of the state that most political theorists use is about 100 years old, and it was first given by Max Weber, famous sociologist. Basically what he said was that, this is in 1919, he said, the state is that organization, the only organization that lays claim to a monopoly on violence in a particular geographical area. Okay, I know that's, that's tough. Monopoly on violence in a particular geographic area. Best example is this. If I suspect that my neighbor has done something that I don't like, something I have a rule against, personally, in my own home, I'm not allowed to get a bunch of my friends, suit up in black, go ram down his door, put a gun in his face, tie him up, drag him off somewhere, and put him in a cage. I'm not allowed to do that. There's only one organization that is allowed to do that. That organization is the state. So if you're wondering if something is the state, that's the measure that you go by. You say, is this group allowed to go break down people's doors, kidnap them, whatever? So that's a monopoly on violence. And in that way, the state is a gun. A uh, saying that I first heard Stefan Molyneux say, I'm not sure that he was the first person to say it, but he certainly popularized it and I think it's amazing. He said, laws or a law is an opinion with a gun. I'll give you a recent example that happened to me to show exactly what I mean by an opinion with a gun. I was driving back to my house late one night from the art gallery that I owned. I had just been doing some work, went a little late. It was maybe midnight, 1 a.m. when I finished up. Locked up, got in my car, started driving home. Now, I only live about a mile and a half, two miles away. But as I'm driving, so I'm kind of taking the back roads, you know, there's no major roads that really go in the fastest route. As I'm driving, behind me, I see cop lights. Whew! My whole back of my car lights up with the floodlight. Hear the siren. So, what do I do? I pull over. Cop comes up, typical, license and registration. Do you know why I pulled you over? I have no idea. Turns out my light, not my tail light, but the light that is over my license plate was out. Now, he's got his high beams shining on the back of my car. He can obviously make out my license plate, but the law says that that particular light has to be on, otherwise you can be issued a ticket. Now, the light is since fixed, and I can tell you that was, at AutoZone, a $2.50 light. So we checked my license, checked my registration. Insurance was all up to date. He asked me, where are you coming from? I said, I own an art gallery down the street. I'm going to, uh, to my house. And my house happens to be in a... a kind of exclusive neighborhood so he said all right well here's your stuff get that light fixed have a nice day and that was it maybe a total five ten minute interaction why did I stop why did I stop I knew I wasn't speeding I knew for sure that my license and registration were current I know for a fact that I don't have any warrants. I had just started on the road. I knew I hadn't gone past any stoplights or stop signs. Why did I stop? I knew for sure I hadn't broken any laws. 
Why did I comply? Well, what happens if I don't comply? What happens if I don't stop? I know I didn't do anything wrong. And fundamentally, I think when we look at the situation, the reality is $2.50 LED light that I was able to put on in five minutes, had I really done anything wrong? But the law says it's got to be there. So there was author he was authorized to stop me. But let's say I don't stop. Let's say I continue on. Okay, now that, I, that I'm not complying with stopping, it just flipped under law. It flipped from a $2.50 light being out, which at most would have been a little fix-it ticket citation that after I got it fixed would probably cost me 10 bucks or whatever. Now it flips to evading. In most states, this is a misdemeanor. This is an arrestable offense. So long as I don't hurt anybody, damage any property in the process of evading, or put an officer's life at risk. If I do any of those things, it moves to a felony. But in this case, it is just a misdemeanor, but it's an arrestable offense. So when my car finally does come to a stop, what's going to happen? The cops are going to jump out. Probably by this time, there will be several cars. They're going to draw their guns. They're going to tell me to get out of the car, get down on the ground. Now, if I run some more, I decide, fuck that. I haven't done anything wrong and take off. They're going to come after me. And they're eventually going to catch me, tackle me, take me to the ground. Even if I'm laying on the ground, they're going to come up and they're going to attempt to arrest me, detain me, take me away. Now, what happens if I resist that arrest, either after running, particularly after running, or from the point where I'm on the ground? Well, now they're authorized to subdue me. That may be knees to the back. That could be a chokehold. Depends on how hard I, I resist. Could be a taser. Could end up like the kid on the BART train, right? Where they were just, they just had people laid out because they heard there had been a fight and the officer accidentally drew his gun and shot the kid. The law was made. All of those laws, tail light out, what constitutes evading, what constitutes resisting arrest, and the gun is there the whole time. Because if I carry through not complying, at the end, there's a gun. At the end, there's the real threat of death or injury over something that could be as small as a $2.50 light. Which brings me to the point of this video. This video is about the third party vote. Those people out there who are never Trump and never Hillary. One of the first times in this country that I've really seen this where people look at both candidates with disgust, where there's this huge percentage and I mean, if you look at the actual, the, the actual numbers of this, it could be 20% of the electorate of people who were going to vote are just really disgusted with both major party candidates, which has really left Gary Johnson of the Libertarian Party and Jill Stein of the Green Party, where people are actually talking about these third party candidates. I guess it's really four in this case. With the understanding that a law is just an opinion with a gun, then electing someone to either legislative, executive, or even judicial, because when a judge makes a ruling and they write why they made that ruling on a point of law, 
to say whether a law is going to be enforced or not be enforced, well, that's actually literally called an opinion. In the Supreme Court, the majority vote, there's a majority opinion and a minority opinion. And when those opinions are enforced, as in, say, Brown versus Board of Education, when they integrated the schools, those kids were accompanied by National Guard soldiers with guns. In that case, it really was an opinion with a gun, literally. So when you elect someone to office, this is why voting is violence. Because when you elect someone in who's going to create new laws, as a president will, either through executive orders, which is now all the rage, or by signing something into law. And there hasn't been a president who has not signed a single law into law, who has not signed a bill into law. When you vote those people in, you are, in effect, making a vote to point a gun at someone. And if you look at what the disgust with the candidates is from the people who rail against them, at the core of it is really that. What's the only real policy plank that you know of Donald Trump? Going to build a wall, deport illegals. And the whole idea that Donald Trump's a racist, Donald Trump's a racist. Why would it be a problem if Donald Trump was a racist? Why would it be a problem if Hitler's an anti-Semite? Because when you have control of the state, you have a gun pointing. And if you have a racist, the, the, the thought process is, well, I'm a person of color, there's going to be a gun pointed at me. If you're worried about Donald Trump being a racist, you already know that the state is a gun, don't you? And what is it for Hillary Clinton? Hillary Clinton's going to take our guns, which that one's so fucking meta. Hillary Clinton's going to take our guns. There's going to be a gun pointed at the gun owner to get them to take, to get them to give up their guns. Right? Bernie Sanders wanted to point a gun at the 1%, right? They need to pay more of their taxes. They need to pay their fair share. The 1%, the 1%. The 1% is not going to be happy with Bernie in office because there go the guns. Point it right at the 1%. So the problem with a third party candidate is one of both a practical nature and an ethical nature. From a practical standpoint, the third party candidate isn't going to win. There's no realistic scenario where Gary Johnson or Jill Stein becomes the president, but yet they're asking for your donation. They're asking for your vote. They're spending that money. That's how during the campaign they're eating. They're paying for office space. They're paying staff. The staff is eating on that. You're basically giving money to a bunch of people who are creating no product whatsoever. None. Has zero market value. Can't do anything with it. Zero utility. Except to make you feel good that you didn't vote for either of the other two candidates. How about you just keep your money, stay home, don't vote. You're richer and you have more free time on your hands. But the most important problem is ethical. Because if you have a problem with, with the gun of the state being pointed at you, the correct answer is not 
to go down the checklist until you sufficiently feel that the gun is no longer being pointed at you. You're a, you know, you like to use weed from time to time. But you're a little more conservative. You're a Republican that likes to smoke weed. Oh, there's Gary Johnson, because the Republicans wanted to point the gun at the weed smoker. Or you're a Democrat, but you really would like to tax Wall Street a whole lot more. And use that gun to deliver some butter to some other people. You know, improve the environment. Let's point the gun at some polluters a little more that Hillary Clinton wouldn't do. Well, here's Jill Stein. But they're still pointing the gun at someone because the laws aren't going off the books. And in fact, they're all going to make new laws. The answer to not wanting the gun of the state pointed at you is not to go down the line until it's veered away and there's no way of it hitting you. The answer is to have some empathy and to realize that if you don't want the gun of the state pointed at you, you shouldn't be pointing the gun of the state at others. That's the only ethical move. The only ethic, ethical and moral stand is a stand where there is no state. It's a move toward a stateless society. Because you are free to make your choices in life. You are free to have an opinion. But you're not allowed, from a moral standpoint, to enforce that opinion with a gun.